On July 25th, a single blog post from OpenAI erased about $70 billion from Alphabet's market value. No wonder Google's investors are worried. ChatGPT is coming up on 200 million active users. But search, I mean, why would OpenAI want to take on Goliath? Google does make over half their annual revenue, a nice $175 billion from search ads. But I don't think OpenAI wants to start putting ads on your chat. OpenAI is more than well-funded. It doesn't seem that they're desperate to generate extra revenue at this point. But what they absolutely need is data to train their models, which I'm going to get back to. But there are three theories as to why OpenAI is launching Search GPT. So theory one is just why not? If ChatGPT can already answer our questions, why not package that thing as a search engine as well? Now, the mind-blowing thing about this is that the way ChatGPT works and the way Google works achieve the same thing, but they just take completely different paths to it. So let's go back to the basics. The problem with traditional search engines is that you just can't go and search for content on every single server every single time. Establishing a connection with a server can take about 50 milliseconds. But if you multiply that by the more than 1 billion websites out there, it could take about two years just to establish connections to the websites, not to mention searching what's in them. So in order to efficiently search for something, you need to have all that data in the same place. Before we get everything in the same place, we have to discover what's being shared on the internet. And that's the crawling part. The closest thing to a single place and mini internet is actually one of Google's indexes. About 60% of the internet is duplicate, so a lot of things need to be filtered out before it makes it to the index. And then finally, once you've crawled and filtered and stored the data in the index, you can run a search on it. Now, a large language model like the one ChatGPT runs on accomplishes a similar task to a search engine, but uses just a completely different approach. Now, estimates suggest that GPT-4 was trained on about 1.8 trillion parameters, which would represent about 6.5 terabytes worth of text data. The model is trained on all this text, allowing it to understand and generate human-like responses. And when you ask a question, the model doesn't search for the internet for an answer. Instead, it leverages this extensive training to generate a response based on patterns and information encoded in its neural net. Now, this means that the answer is derived from the knowledge that's embedded in the model while it was trained, rather than a list of strategically ordered web pages, as you would see on a Google search. But if you add real-time learning to that neural network, then you've got yourself an AI search engine. But, but the result is not a search for pages, but rather an answer that's synthesized from the model's understanding and knowledge. The result to the user is similar, sometimes better, because you don't have to scroll through three pages to find the answer that you needed. And I will bet you a dollar that a fair share of the 200 million people using ChatGPT today probably prefer asking ChatGPT over running a new Google search. While Google's search ads revenue has remained rather stable, for now, Gartner predicts that by 2026, search traffic on traditional search engines will decrease by 25%. And that report came before search GPT was even announced. For OpenAI, adding search to their list of services would only mean more users, which probably means more people using their paid subscription. If ChatGPT can do the work of searching, why not add a new UI layer on top of it and turn it into a search engine? Like ChatGPT already solved like 95% of the work needed to answer that search. But OpenAI is not the only one creeping into Google's turf. For Gen Z's, TikTok is a new search engine too. In our studies, something like almost 40% of young people, when they're looking for a place for lunch, they don't go to Google Maps or search, they go to TikTok or Instagram. And that brings me to my second theory. Google search is kind of messy these days. We need to understand a little more context about how Google search works for this one. So let's go back to 1993. The internet was just this playground of geeks and scientists. No experts in SEO or search existed. And their first approach to solving web search was to figure out ways to create these bots, these programs that would automatically go to every page, every server, and store information in a single database. And finally, that December, this guy did it. He launched JumpStation, the first search engine that operated more or less like a modern search engine. Now, you might be as old as me to remember Lycos or Webcrawler and of course, Yahoo, but all of these search engines were really bad at understanding what was on a page. They would rank a page by how often a keyword appeared on that page or website. And of course, as soon as people figured out how that worked, they just started keyword stuffing that page with a single word. 
And so a couple of PhD students from Stanford came up with this new system. Instead of ranking a website based on what it said, they started looking at relationships between websites. And so the Google algorithm today may be their best kept secret, but almost 30 years later, we know that this is something that they care about because they literally wrote a scientific paper about it. Links between pages, backlinks. That's what defines what they call page rank. So the innovation that Google brought to the industry back in the day was that they started counting backlinks between pages. So the more backlinks a page had, the more authority it would have in the eyes of Google. For example, if the New York Times publishes a new article, lots of other websites will pick up the story and they will link to the original source. And because of all these backlinks from other websites, Google will know that the original article came from the New York Times and will give it a lot of authority. So if you search for the story in Google, they put it at the top. Any website that the Times' homepage links to immediately acquires value. And this thing worked. The results worked, and that's what made Google the giant that it is today. So people are always trying to figure out how to optimize for the algorithm. There's a lot of money in ranking well on Google, and companies have built entire empires on top of it. Through the years, people have found ways to rank better, which Google tends to shut down with new updates to their system, which they call core updates. But hacking Google or trying to cheat Google is still a thing. For example, Think of every recipe that you've ever found online. You have to scroll through this insufferable story of how the recipe came to be, how they found it from their grandma's cooking book and their second cousin, and they changed that. Years ago, this hack of creating these long articles loaded with keywords in order to rank became pervasive. Now, this has become habit despite numerous evolutions to Google's search algorithm. And then there's backlinks. There is real value in getting links from other pages. And there could be armies of minions emailing pages with good authority, begging them or even paying for backlinks to help them rank better. Now, using paid links is a direct violation of Google's guidelines and can result in a penalty, but people still do it, which makes the experience less ideal for you and for me. Google search is getting worse. And that's why, for example, more and more people are either moving their searches elsewhere or adding Reddit to their searches so that you avoid the spam of well-ranked sites and you search for real human answers to a question. Now, the root of all products and startups and businesses is solving a problem, a pain point that their potential customers are experiencing. Search has become a growing pain point. And if something like Search GPT can solve it better than Google does, well, that is a clear business opportunity. Perplexity is a good example of how Search GPT could look. It's a large language model, AI-powered search engine that probably didn't see Search GPT coming to eat its dinner. But anyway, I ran a search for pitch deck software in Perplexity. And by some coincidence, my company came up first. Now, we haven't done anything. We have no clue as to why, and we don't understand what we can do to protect our ranking here. It's just a black box. And this is the opportunity that Search GPT opens for everything, for everyone. An answer that an AI determined and that the company can't easily influence. Disclaimer though, companies can influence AI results by infiltrating the data sources that are used to train LLMs and changing the way they create content. But going back to the Reddit case for a moment and the last theory. Training data for large language models is the new hot commodity. Large language models become smarter by reading books and articles and real conversations by real people. And companies that sit on top of real human generated content have discovered that they are, well, sitting on a gold mine. Now, the New York Times is suing OpenAI because it trained its models on the Times' articles. OpenAI's theory, thesis on this is that, well, if that data is public, their crawlers should be should be able to read it. But companies like the New York Times most certainly don't want their original work being monetized, at least indirectly, by a bot that got smarter because of their articles. And Reddit recently struck a deal to let OpenAI into their gold mine of human writing and trolling. But here's the gist of it. What if the new rising search engine that everyone is using is a large language model that's not only reading what's on the page, but using that content to train itself? In that case, you might not have a choice but to let the crawlers read through your content. Elon notoriously blocked API access to Twitter in part for this reason. He didn't want AI bots from using Twitter's, I guess, X's huge library of content to train themselves. And X can maybe get away with it because their traffic doesn't come from search. But what if your business does depend on search traffic? And I think that that's the key to everything. According to OpenAI, websites can opt out of having their content used to train OpenAI's models and still be surfaced in search. But I think a serious question is if SearchGPT will treat websites that opt out the same as websites that opt in. 
at least for my business, if I'm getting ranked better by letting GPT train itself on our writing in the blog, by all means, crawl away GPT, but that may have other more serious implications for the future as these LLMs get even smarter. Either way you look at it, the prospect of this AI-powered search could shake the ground for how search works today, and it's definitely already shaking the ground for Google, at least. Also remember, Microsoft, which owns Bing, also owns 49% of OpenAI. While they technically don't control the company, mostly to avoid antitrust scrutiny, they probably do have a massive influence on OpenAI's feature pipeline. It is absolutely in their best interest to weaken Google's dominance in search, even if they're not gonna make more money from it right away. Now finally, and perhaps more concerning, search results in AI-powered search engines are a black box. What makes a website rank? What is relevant to the model? How about misinformation? When will we be able to trust those answers the way we trust Google's results today? Have to wait and see. At least there won't be any ads, hopefully.